Jodie, the books that you write tend to be really issue-based, and you've written about stem cell research, date rape, teenage suicide pact. Why? <laughs> because um, I tend to write about the things that keep me up at night. Um, I think that my books feel very timely because people worry about the exact same things mm -hmm. that I worry about. So do you, you start these books with quite strong opinions then about, mm. the, about the issues that you're talking yes, about? Yes, I do. Um, and that's okay because part of the job for me is to hear the other side. Mm. And really that's, that's what I hope for as an author. I hope that I can get you to listen to the other side maybe for the first time in your life. You may not change your mind. That's okay. I think having the discussion is what's really important. It's when I say, I'm right and you're wrong that we start to get into trouble. And this book, the book that we're talking about today, is again it's based around some very big serious questions but this time you haven't just gone for one question <laughs> I've got the multiple gone ones for yeah. about three I think there's um, same-sex marriage and bringing up children within a same-sex marriage right. um, religious conservatism and also probably the most sort of current pressing urgent one is what happens to embryos that a couple has frozen mm -hmm. when that couple then splits up right and who owns them are they property are they people and right what? Um, why did you decide to <laughs> put to them all together? All the book for me really began with gay rights because in America that to me is the last civil right that hasn't been granted. Mm. And I really wanted to ask why. Why is it a big deal in America? It's not a big deal in the UK, not nearly as big a deal. And um, the answer to that really is the conservative Christian right in America. Although the vast majority of Christians are very supportive of gays and gay rights, there is a very vocal minority that right now has both the pulpit and a large megaphone. And they're the ones with a lot of political influence influence that are um, trying to keep gay marriage from being constitutional and keep gay parenting from happening. The book's narrated by three different characters and one of them, Max, really puts that viewpoint forward and he does it in a way that um, I found sort of surprisingly cogent, sympathetic mm -hmm. and, you know, was it difficult to write as somebody who, who, who pretty much thinks <laughs> the opposite? It was very hard. One of the things that made this book very personal for me is that my oldest son came out to my husband and myself while we were wow. while I was working on the book. And although I knew he was most likely gay and could have told you that when he was very, very young, it was great that as a high school kid he felt comfortable enough to share that with us. And we we're incredibly proud of him. We love him to death. And we were very supportive parents about his sexual orientation. Not all kids have that when mm. um, when they're coming out to their parents. Um, for me, writing this book became extremely important because it's a mission as a mom to make the world a slightly better, more tolerant place by the time Kyle's ready to get married and have kids. But it also meant that I did have to do my homework. Mm. And that meant, in this case, doing a six-hour interview with Focus on the Family, which is uh, under the umbrella of Exodus International. They, um, on their website, describe themselves as an evangelical Christian group that champions freedom from homosexuality through Jesus Christ. Right. And I did a six hour interview with a woman who it should be said is no longer with the organization and I gave her much credit for wanting to even meet with me mm -hmm. knowing what I was writing about. When I suggested that maybe the Bible had a lot to say but it wasn't the best sex manual, you know, um, for example, <laughs> it also advocates polygamy and stoning a bride who's not a virgin and uh, marrying 11 year old girls. She we've said, got past right, by you know, much, yeah. But she said, well, you know, that doesn't matter. It's not always God's intent for sexual behavior. So only when it suits her purposes was it God's intent for sexual behavior. And this is actually... This is during Almost the interview. reproduced in the book, isn't it? Right, this, and, this and that's the thing. You know, the, everything that Pastor Clive and anyone in Max's church says in the book comes verbatim from that six-hour interview. Obviously, these books are striking a chord with people. They're very, very popular. But I was thinking, um, I was looking back and found a 2007 interview that appeared in The Observer um, in which you're described as one of those authors of whom literary editors have never heard and readers can't get enough of. Does it bother you that these are books that are read but not really reviewed? There is a very artificial schism between literary and commercial fiction, which I've always been very upfront about. Commercial fiction writers get money poured into their books for advertising and marketing. Literary writers do not. Commercial writers get a much wider print run and reach more people. Literary writers do not. Literary writers win prizes and get um, highly literary reviews, and commercial writers Writers do not. Um, and you know, that's sort of the trade-off you make when you decide mm. with your publisher which, which path you're taking. Uh, in my case, when I started writing, I was classified as a literary novelist. And uh, I can't say there's anything really different about my books then and now. <laughs> uh, the difference is that I made a very dedicated decision to be a commercial novelist because I wanted to reach as many people as possible. 
My feeling is if I happen to create a well-written book and also get it out to the masses, well, so be it. Um, I think that's okay. It just means that you have to sometimes swallow a little bit of humble pie and be on a bestseller list with people whose writing you think may not be quite as heavily crafted as your own or or anything like that. Um, I can't say that I, I am upset about the fact that I don't get reviewed in a literary journal um, or that I don't win a prize. Uh, I wonder sometimes what makes those writers different from commercial writers who put in the time to write a good book and to be serious about their fiction. Because uh, I, I don't think there really is any different. Mm. I think when you write about um, core human experience, uh, it doesn't really matter if you're literary or commercial. Uh, it just matters that you tell tell an honest truth. This book, to return to, to the book in question today, um, this is a particularly unusual book because it actually involves a lot of music, doesn't yes. it? Yes. Zoe, who is the main character in this book, is a music therapist. Music is so important to her that I really wanted her to have a voice in this book as a lesbian character. She is. Um, she starts out in this book married to a man and when their marriage breaks apart and he joins a very right-wing church, she winds up throwing herself into her music therapy instead and falls in love with another woman for the first time in her life. And I wanted you to hear her. I thought music was a great venue for that because it was so important to her. There aren't chapters in Sing You Home, there are tracks, and each track corresponds to a downloaded say track. Be no pain. Instead you made me strong. The moment I'm going to be reading about is probably the, the turning point of the book, where Zoe realizes that with her new partner, Vanessa, um, it's not going to be quite as easy to start a family using her frozen embryos from her previous marriage. So this is Zoe. I like Elle and Hannah. Does every baby name have to be a palindrome, Vanessa asks. I have been pregnant three times and have avoided doing just this, hoping. It's a lot easier to not be disappointed when you have no expectations, and yet this time I almost can't help myself. There was something about the way I left things with Max that makes me believe this might actually happen. After all, he didn't say no right away, which is what I expected, which means he's still thinking, and, and that has to be good, right? The doorbell rings. You expecting anyone, I ask? Vanessa shakes her head. Are you? A man is standing on the porch, smiling. He's wearing a red baseball cap and a red sock sweatshirt and doesn't strike me as a serial killer, so I open the door. Are you Zoe Baxter? Yes. You've been served. I open the folded document and words leap off the page at me. One, the plaintiff is the biological father of these pre-born children, which were conceived during a heterosexual, God-condoned, constitutional marriage for the purposes of being raised in a heterosexual, God-condoned, constitutional marriage. Two, since these pre-born children were conceived, the parties have divorced. Three, since the final judgment, the defendant has engaged in a deviant, homosexual lifestyle. Zoe? Vanessa sounds like she is a thousand miles away. She grabs the paper out of my hand. I open my mouth, but nothing comes out. There is no language to describe a betrayal this big. Vanessa starts flipping through the pages so quickly I expect them to burst into flame. What is this garbage? Equilibrium is nothing more than smoke and mirrors. You can be punched without ever fielding a blow. It's from Max, I say. He's trying to take away our baby. I believe in 